Good afternoon, everyone. I am Z Scott, president of Chicago State University, and I am delighted to welcome you to the second installment of our 2022 Black History Month presidential lecture series. I'd like to take a moment to recognize and thank our sponsors for this year's series, our premier sponsor, Discover Financial, and our associate sponsor, J.P. Morgan Chase. We're grateful for their sponsorship and their ongoing support of Chicago State University. I'd also like to welcome and thank today's speaker, Professor Cynthia Nash, Nance, and student moderate Mayor Sydney Russell for joining us this afternoon. And, like, and finally, I'd like to thank each of you for joining in us virtually. This year's campus Black History Month theme is lifting as we climb our stories continue. This theme highlights the accomplishments of our ancestors and our responsibilities to generations to come. In alignment with the vision behind this year's presidential lecture series is to, we wanna highlight and the incredible accomplishments and, comp, and accomplishments of our universe, Chicago State University alum. Today, you'll hear from an amazing Chicago State University alumna who has gone on to be a leader in the legal profession and her community. And as you know, we have an amazing student this afternoon who will interview uh, Professor Nance and her name is Sydney Moore. Sydney is a graduating senior majoring in criminal justice. She transferred to Chicago State in 2019. She currently serves as a president of the Chicago State Pre-Law Society. After graduation in May, Sydney plans to attend law school. She plans to practice civil and criminal law and lives by Dr. King's words, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And also joining this conversation this afternoon is our alum, Cynthia E. Nance. Professor Nance served as Dean Emeritus and the Nathan G. Gordon Professor at the University of Arkansas Fayetteville School of Law. Professor Nance earned her BS degree from Chicago State Magna Cum Laude in economics. She holds a JD with distinction from the University of Iowa College of Law. And we saw her law school graduation in the photographs. And she holds a Master of Arts from the University of Iowa College of Business. She joined the Arkansas Law Faculty as an assistant professor in 1994 and served as Dean of the Law School from 2006 to 2011. Her teaching and scholarship focus on labor and employment law, workplace le legislation, poverty law, and lawyers as leaders. She was the law school's first director of pro bono and community engagement. Professor Nance is the chair of the American Bar Foundation Fellows and a former A Circuit member of the American Bar Association's Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary. She represents the ABA Labor and Employment Law Section in the House of Delegates. Professor Nance is a fellow of the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers and an elected member of its governors, Board of Governors. 
currently serving as a treasurer of the college. She is also an elected member of the American Law Institute and the Labor Law Group Executive Committee and serves on the Arkansas Advisory Committee to the United States Civil Rights Commission. In addition to her service in the legal profession, Professor Nance is an Arkansas PBS commissioner. As a charter member of the Phi Omega, Phi Alpha Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Professor Nance currently serves on the Graduates Advisory Council for the Kappa Iota chapter and the South Central Representative to the International Standards Committee. She has received numerous rewards, too many to name, for her outstanding and committed service. But those awards do include the Richard S. Arnold Award for Distinguished Service in the Ruston District of Arkansas by the Eighth Circuit Bar Association, the University of Iowa Hancher Finbein Medallion, the American Bar Association Mar Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award. And I will tell you, that is an incredibly difficult award to receive. Professor Nance is also recognized as one of Diverse Issues in Higher Education Magazine's 25 Women Making a Difference. She is an incredible alum, and we are so happy to have her here with us this afternoon for our, the interview. So please join me in welcoming Sydney Moore and Professor Cynthia E. Nance. Ladies, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Scott. That was a wonderful introduction. I have a lot to live up to. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, before that interview, Dr. Scott. Professor Nance, I'd like to just jump right in. Okay. So can you start by telling us what were your favorite, one of your favorite memories at Chicago State University? Well, it may seem like a strange answer, but a favorite memory is being tutored in math. Uh, I had struggled uh, with advanced algebra and calculus, and my tutor, David, showed me that I could do it. Uh, that came in handy later at Iowa when I was required to take several advanced stats classes. And rather than being freaked out or despairing, uh, I found a tutor uh, and I did well. So I think too many students are discouraged in STEM in general. And my experience with him made me really confident of my ability to excel. That's excellent. And how has Chicago State, how has it prepared for success in your career and in your life currently? Well, I, I will say I gained a solid background in my major, which was economics and also finance. But I think more importantly, being at an HBCU was a major change in environment that instilled confidence for the next steps in my academic career. Um, it was also great for me uh, because I was working full time on the midnight shift. And I was able to take classes that I needed either in the day or at night. And the professors were very understanding uh, about a student who was juggling work and school. Yeah, definitely. And who, and ha has there been any one person who has influenced um, in your life from Chicago State? Well, I have to mention those of you who saw the introductory PowerPoint uh, know about Dr. Cisse. Dr. Cisse was a department chair. Uh, it was then political science and economics. And he encouraged me to apply to law school when I, I would say reticent. Uh, and he even offered to help me with the application fee if, if that's what the problem was, which it really wasn't. I just was tired of going to school. <laughs> <laughs> and then obviously at the fact that he drove to Iowa and later attended my law school graduation was just an enormous blessing to me. He gave me my first briefcase. Um, there was Dr. Kane, who was an econ professor who took lots of time with me and was very encouraging. And a finance professor, Dr. Brown, who was awesome because I had never seen a black woman in that role prior to taking her class. I can definitely sympathize and agree with that. I too have had some of the most amazing professors that I will be sad to go, but they've all <laughs> told me they're not going anywhere and they're gonna stick with me. So were you a traditional student? 
Uh, no, not in any sense of the word. Uh, it took me 10 years to complete my undergraduate degree and that route including, included having attended Valparaiso, the College of DuPage, and finally landing at Chicago State uh, for the win. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, I was working full time on the midnight shift at Ace Hardware's corporate headquarters in Oak Brook, Illinois, as a computer operator and a scheduler. So I, I don't think I was by any means traditional. And presidents, I know uh, in the introduction that we talked about the specialty of law that you practice. So I know you started in the career of academy versus going directly into practicing law. Can you share a little bit about why that decision was for you? Sure. While I was at Iowa, I was working in the Iowa Labor Center as a graduate assistant. And because of that, the College of Business reached out to me to pursue a PhD in industrial relations, which I did. And then at that point, I was encouraged to pursue an academic career. It just so happened that the timing was perfect because at that time, Iowa Law established a fellowship for diverse law grads to enter the academy. And so I was selected for that Iowa Law Fellowship and the rest is history, as they say. So can you briefly um, explain what is the Career Academy for those of our viewers who do not know what that is? Oh, yes. So teaching, so being a professor, being an academic rather than a practitioner, although I will share with the audience that I did have a wee bit of labor law practice because one of the Iowa alums hired me in his practice as his law clerk. And so I did do a little bit of practice, but not very much. And how did you select a specialty of law? So it was a combination of law school coursework uh, that business PhD program, which was industrial relations, which is labor involves labor, and also working at the labor center. Uh, I have to say too, that uh, coming from the South side of Chicago and a blue collar background, um, my dad was a teamster uh, and later a postal worker. I have a brother who's a master carpenter and another who's a master electrician. So I was really well versed in the labor movement. And um, workplace issues are fascinating and they're central to all our lives. And I wanted to engage with them and also to help working people. Excellent. So I know at the University of Arkansas, I know you were nominated and selected to be the Dean of the Pro Bono Program. So would you mind sharing your experience and telling us what the pro bono program is and what essentially would this do for law school students? Ah, Sydney, that's a good question. So the first thing is a pro bono program um, encourages law students to give a free legal advice to those who need it most, who might not otherwise have representation. The idea is by building that culture, then as they go on to practice, they'll continue to do the same thing. What does it do for students? Instead of reading about the law in a book, there you are with a client working to help them address their legal issues. And so it's a, it's a way to engage with the law prior to graduation. And we do recognize those students who give a tremendous uh, number of hours at graduation in the bullet in the printed program. So being the director or the first director was a wonderful experience. And I got to work with my best friend in establishing it because she's an engineer. And so she built the technology piece of the program, which allowed us to make the opportunities available online centrally and to track student hours and supervisor feedback. So in setting up the program, I worked with many of the community partners that I already knew and reached out to additional entities to create additional opportunities for students to engage in pro bono. And it was a natural fit because at Dean, I had recognized the students who had given the most pro bono hours. So this was sort of a natural extension of that experience. And I must say our current director, Professor Annie Smith has 
use that foundation and increase the program exponentially, which is good for our students and good for the community. Excellent, excellent. So you're such a professional woman, but what do you do for a hobby? We all have to have a little time to relax. What are some of those hobbies that you enjoy? Oh, well, I love to travel. Uh, I've been to every continent except Antarctica. I also like to travel alone and to get out of your comfort zone and experience the culture of the people in the country you're visiting. Uh, I'm an avid gardener. Actually, I would take a lot of pride in my yard and my garden and my flowers. And uh, you might not expect it, but I'm also a Harley rider. I uh, have a Harley Sportster. <laughs> yes. So while traveling, you love to travel. I love to travel as well. So while traveling, have you ever used a lawyer's um, perspective when you travel as to when you travel, do you notice different countries and different places, how the court system runs and their laws of such? Yes. In fact, I was invited to the Mariana Islands to be the inaugural keynote speaker at their MLK celebration. They had never had one before. And so it was a very big honor to be the first speaker. Um, but while I was there, there were a number of lawyers there. And so I gave a continuing legal education program and also visited with the women, both on uh, Saipan, Rhoda and Tinian, about their rights as women. And so that was very empowering for them. And it was a great experience for me. Um, I went on a trip uh, for the university to Belize and uh, we were visiting a school, but it happened to be by a court. So I looked in the window and watched the proceedings and noticed the powdered wig and was a woman judge. I was very proud about that. And also on a trip to the Bahamas, I took a cab and went to the law school there and had tea with the principal. So I do like to do that. Yeah. <laughs> that is excellent. So I like to ask, how has race and gender impacted um, being in this legal profession? Well, I know many on this call today or in this attending this webinar today have heard it before, but it's still true that people may have a lower expectation of you based on your race and or gender. And we can see a current example of this when President Biden announced that he would be appointing a black woman to the Supreme Court. A number of congressmen and political commentators talked about skin color over qualifications, tribal warfare, a lesser black woman, even before the nominee has been announced. Now, more personally, as dean, I was aware that I was appointed in the shadow of Central High in Little Rock, and that neither law school had ever had a woman or a person of color at the helm. So it was important for me to be objectively excellent, to dispel the negative thinking and open the door for those who might follow me. Now I'm proud to say both of our state law schools have women law deans, and our law school had the first ever Native American woman law dean, Stacy Leeds, and we are on our fourth consecutive woman dean, the current one being another African American woman, Dean Elena Allen. Our associate dean is also a Black woman, the Dean for Academic Affairs, Tiffany Murphy, so. That's fantastic. And just as we're having this conversation to be able to talk to you and hear that that has happened for, you know, essentially me and some of the guest speakers who may be just graduating and we're trying to accomplish half or one third of what the things that you've already accomplished to know that in the time that we are today, to see people like us be able to rise into these higher level positions, it really shows how time is changing and how those that have the credentials, regardless of the skin tone, they're pushing forward and they're going after the things that they deserve and are more than qualified for. So that's excellent. 
So did you have a mentor along the way? I have been very blessed, Sydney, uh, to have a number of mentors. In addition to those I've mentioned from Chicago State, um, the admissions director at Iowa, when I was recruited to law school, is named Dennis Shields. He's now the president of the University of uh, Wisconsin Platteville. He remains in my life. In fact, he sent a dozen roses when I became dean, um, as well as a number of women professors during law and several practicing lawyers since, including Carolyn Witherspoon here who's been more, more than a mentor. She's also been a sponsor, nominating me for various awards and opportunities. So I, I've just been, I've had a richness uh, of support. Yes. And can you talk a little bit about one of, what's one of the most impactful awards that you have received throughout your? Have, yeah, awards or the biggest career? Accomplishments, awards, okay. what have you? been nominated and you think this is one a nomination that has impacted you okay so in terms of uh recognitions and awards um i'm very proud of receiving the richard s arnold distinguished service award that president scott mentioned um because it was awarded to me from the judges who know me best here in the western district of arkansas and to receive recognition from the federal judiciary is a very big honor. And Judge Arnold was a stellar jurist whom I both knew and highly respected. Um, another one I think I, I'm very proud about is the Margaret Brent Award from the American Bar Association uh, and the Commission of Women in the Profession. And it honors five outstanding women lawyers each year who have perceived, uh, achieved professional excellence and paved the way for other women in the legal profession. And of course, um, a ju the judge, I'm promoting her, President Scott, mentioned the Iowa um, Hancher Finkbein Award. And whenever you get an award from your uh, alma mater, that is very important. Uh, and that award actually, um, you receive that for exemplifying learning, leadership, and loyalty. And of course, being spotlighted today is a very big honor for me. Wow. You are impeccable, Professor Nance. So I have a question. So um, as the president of the Pring Law Society at CSU, a question that I often hear some of our members and just people, different students in my classes, um, when you talk about law school, a lot of students talk about the barrier of not being able to maybe pay for it. So can you talk about a little bit or give a piece of advice to students who maybe want to pursue law school, but they don't think they can based off cost? Yeah, and I was really glad you raised this because I had time to think about it and I've got a few, few leads for you, few responses here. So the first thing I'd say is, check out LSAC's, the Law School Admission Council's Discover Law website. Also, as you're considering your law school choice, think about a good state school, uh, just in terms of tuition, and don't be afraid to weigh your options. If you get an offer from one school, hang tight and uh, look at the deadline, but also see what another school offers. Um, there's money out there that often goes on claim, so be sure to do your research about that. Also, if you have interest in public interest law, there's a public interest loan forgiveness program that's worth investigating when you graduate that will forgive much of your loans after 10 years of public service. <clears throat> and then many students work during their summers as law clerks and as upperclassmen, they can clerk during the year and they can also get a research assistant job and at some law schools, being a research assistant lowers your tuition to in-state. So, so that's something to look at as well. And then some law schools will allow you to establish residency after your first year. And that brings down the cost of tuition as well. Wow, thank you so much for that information. So over the oh, our series for today is to feature our alumni, our stories continue. How does 
Professor Nance's story continue? Well, when I retire from law teaching, I plan to go and work for legal aid to help serve underrepresented individuals. I'm also hoping to start my travels again. And first on my list is Madagascar. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also the first woman of color to be an officer of the College of Labor and Employment Lawyers. And I'm looking forward to serving as the president of that organization. Wow. So you're going to continue to stay busy. Yes. <laughs> Even after you retire. Okay. Yes. So what, what piece of career advice um, would you maybe want to share to our audience today? You can do or be whatever you set out to be, whatever you desire. Always strive to be excellent and know that if you end up in a career that you don't like, you can pivot and do something else. Your credentials will allow you to do that. Also, I wanna remind you not to forget while you're on the way up to extend a hand to those behind you uh, and to be mindful of your dash. You know what that is? You know, when someone passes away, uh, it says from, in my case, 1958 dash, what is your dash? What, how do you want to leave the world? What do you want your legacy to be? Make a difference. Wow, that, that's it. I have really, really enjoyed this conversation and I'm so happy and, and honored that I was chosen to do this interview and be able to talk to you. You have done impeccable work and to know that you once sat in the same seats that I've sat in is even more just, it's thrilling to me. Um, and it, I think it really shows our audience today and our CSU students that coming from an HBCU, we are the only one up north and the fact that there is life. We have our wonderful advisors and professors that um, stick with us and really encourage. I know all my professors have encouraged me to go to law school and they're on me about it. And they're like, we're gonna know what you're doing because we're gonna keep up with you. So those aspects that you talked about, we really need them and we need more uh, minority of law deans and uh, professional attorneys and judges to, to, to really get some, 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 some change in the system. So thank you so much for this conversation today, Dr. Nance. And well, I'd like thank to you, thank you, Sydney. I want to thank you, especially because you took time out on your birthday to visit with me. So happy birthday and thank, thank you for a lovely thank interview. You. Thank you. We were going to turn it back over to Professor Scott now. President Scott, I apologize. Okay. Thank you, Sydney, for that great interview. And thank you, uh, Professor Nance, for your comments and words of wisdom. I took some notes uh, to, to share with our, uh, on our social media uh, after this broadcast. Uh, but before we conclude, we want to also recognize uh, Matt Johansson, who's, who's here with us this afternoon. Uh, Matt is, is was for, with, with our sponsor, uh, our premier sponsor for this event, Discover Financial. Most of you know that on the south side of the Chicago, uh, Discover Financial has, has, has a great presence here right now, just blocks away from the Chicago State campus. They've opened up an incredible business center uh, that's offering jobs and opportunities, including opportunities for our students. So Matt, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you for a few words uh, on behalf of Discover. Thank you, President Z. It's, uh... It is an honor to be able to sponsor the presidential lecture series. Uh, and so on behalf of all of Discover, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's uh, certainly humbling uh, to hear about the impact that Chicago State had on uh, your life and then your career, Professor Nance. You are an inspiration uh, that was outstanding. And Sydney, you did a great job. If you're a representative of the future of Chicago State, uh, it's in good hands. So uh, one of the highlights, you know, since we've opened our doors on 85th and Cottage Grove, uh, as Z said, in June, has been the opportunity to partner with her and the Chicago State community uh, to find out how we can work together and further each other's missions. Uh, and so again, this is just a great honor. Uh, and re we really appreciate uh, the opportunity to sponsor this series. Great job all.
You know, the wonderful thing about sponsorship is that uh, uh, Discover has made a generous financial contribution to the university for this, for this lecture series. And that financial contribution will be used to fund scholarships uh, for our graduate students on behalf of our uh, participants in the lecture series. Also, uh, so Professor Nance, before we let you go, there are a couple of questions that okay. we from the audience that we'd like to you to take a take a stab at answering for our listeners. First of all, one question that came in was, "What majors or types of courses do you recommend for students who have an interest in attending law school?" So there's no one, and you know this, uh, President Scott, as well. There's no one major. It's really to do well in your major. But whatever your major, make sure that you write. Uh, it's going to be very important that you be able to communicate well, particularly your writing skills. So uh, engineers go to law school and become patent attorneys. Uh, art majors go to law school and represent art museums. So there's no particular major, but you really need to be able to con communicate well in writing. So no matter what you do, that's very important. Right. And in fact, uh, we have a question from uh, the chair of our English department <laughs> who wanted to know your thoughts on the importance of writing uh, in your career. Absolutely. You, mu you must be able to write. And if you think about what you're going to be doing um, when you turn over your brief or your memo to a judge, if you are not communicating well, I've heard a number of judges fuss about this. Uh, it's really a disadvantage for your client. Uh, so you really want to get your writing skills together and also to do well uh, in law school, you need to be able to write. So I cannot overemphasize that. Take all the courses you can in writing and master that yeah. skill. Ex exactly. And a lot of that comes from our humanities courses like uh, that give you that writing skill alongside a critical thinking, like our history classes and our, our writing, our creative writing classes. Anything that kind of works that writing muscle is an incredible uh, skill for, uh, for law school because people don't appreciate that it's important even how you write your client an email oh, yeah. uh, or how you communicate with your client. So the, the skills you, are, you learn from uh, writing are essential for law school and in the profession. So uh, Professor Nance, we wanna thank you um, for being with us here this afternoon. Uh, you will receive a, a, a token of our appreciation and oh. in, in spirit wear and spirit items that will again <laughs> of your uh, of your time here with us at CSU. Thank you so much for giving us the pictures that brought us back to your start in your life as a graduate of Chicago State University. Uh, I am I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled you accepted our invitation and thank you so much for the wisdom and the information that you provided to our campus and our students this afternoon. So thank you everyone for coming and we appreciate your being here. Again, thanks so much to Discover Financial, uh, our premier sponsor for being with us this afternoon. So we'll see you uh, on February 22nd for the final lecture uh, in this lecture series. Uh, so see everyone then, thanks again for coming.